Welcome to today's event. I am Merla Maika from the eGovernance Academy and uh, today we are going to talk about digital health, data security and the vaccine certificate. Many thanks to Hannes Astok, the eGovernance Academy Executive Di Di uh, Director for the opening words. Many thanks to Galla Giller, the uh, Undersecretary for eHealth and Innovation at the Ministry of Social Affairs of Estonia for his keynote setting the scene for our discussion. I very much agree aiming high um, with the digital vaccine certificate and data exchange is important and I think it's great to hear that Estonia is planning to have the digital vaccine certificate already in, ready in April together with guard time. Today's event is part of the digital transformation talks series of eGovernance Academy. We are going to have two roughly 45-50 minute sessions. Um, the first one will be focusing on the challenges and opportunities of the cross-border data exchange and then after a really short break we shall continue the discussion focusing on how to raise trust towards the vaccine certificate in the second session. It's exciting to know that we have so many viewers. I'm really excited to have um, with us so many good experts. But before we start with the discussion, let me introduce you to today's event environment. We are using an event platform called WorksUp, where you can ask questions by clicking on the Q&A button under both discussion sessions. I really encourage you to do that because I'm certain that many of you have really good, many good questions. If you do not have a question of your own, um, you can ask, uh, I, I can ask uh, you, I would ask you to upvote uh, other people's questions. Uh, the ones that are most upvoted have the highest chance of being asked. So. Be sure to do that. But now let's discuss with our first discussion titled Challenges and Opportunities of Cross-Border Health Data Exchange, where we have Teria Bezzo, member of the management board of the North Estonia Medical Center, Martin Gaivats from the Government Office of Estonia, and Clayton Hamilton, coordinator, digital health flagship the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe. Teria, the floor is yours first. Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, many thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to share as well as learn. Uh, as said, I'm representing here the biggest hospital in Estonia, the North Estonia Medical Center, the name center sometimes confuses some people as it is the center. In fact, it's the hospital. It's the big hospital. It's the biggest, as I said. And we are dealing with almost all aspects of healthcare, uh, including the uh, contagious diseases, including the work with COVID-19, including the vaccination. And uh, as you know, it is the big issue for our healthcare system uh, right now at this moment. But um, I'll tell you about the opportunities and challenges that the exchange of health data would uh, bring. In fact, I would change the title of this session to opportunities first, and then we will see what the challenges are, because I personally see uh, a lot of opportunities in this process. I uh, am absolutely convinced that exchange of health data, access to data, quality of data, all these aspects of health data, that is the, um, that could bring the similar uh, jump in healthcare as in last century we had uh, um, when we started using antibiotics or a century before we started to do the vaccination or at the time when we realized that the, what is the importance of clear water. So I, I think that these health data use analytics uh, really uh, bringing it uh, into the research and understanding, helping people with uh, uh, 
rare diseases or complex diseases would uh, make the really qualitative uh, change. Uh, in my first slide, I am uh, actually, I tried to bring together all the opportunities, all the sources of health data that we uh, have. What we, uh, unfortunately, however, don't use all of it. Uh, because if you go around the clock, then I would say that at uh, 12, uh, the data that I collect myself, we very rarely use nowadays in uh, in our services. Yes, we ask for this information. Of course, the subjective view of the patient is the incremental part of any health uh, record. Uh, but the um, uh, actual uh, data from all kinds of applications or uh, the monitors, we do not necessarily involve in our uh, work. So are the, is the information from uh, telemonitoring, which is also not as widely used as we can. Also, I would say that we are doing a good progress in it, and I'm very happy to say that our health insurance fund is really supporting this approach, uh, and otherwise in this uh, COVID period, we couldn't. So that's uh, what became, was an innovation, uh, looks to become a norm nowadays. And also where we uh, have almost no use of this information that is available is the source of loyalty cards, because people have a lot of information about their lifestyles behind this information, where the uh, owners of these loyalty cards have this information. However, the healthcare system, the GP or the uh, family nurse or your uh, specialist uh, who is treating your chronic condition does not have this information. However, bringing this all together, I would say would add enormous uh, uh, valuable information to your health status, as well as prognosis and the treatment plans that uh, you may have. All other good sources of information, such as e-prescription database in Estonia, uh, where we can not only see what has been prescribed, but also what has been purchased, and we can also see that uh, we have a link uh, to the database where we can see whether the prescribed medicine has any uh, contraindications with other prescribed medicines. We have... Uh, quite well established electronic health records. However, they don't talk to each other. We have not agreed with all these interoperability criteria that would help us to bring together a, a good database involving all Estonian patients, uh, which is actually quite uh, remarkable in that sense because it's 1.3 million. From another hand, in one single hospital where we annually treat approximately 150 thousand uh, single patients, that uh, almost half a million visits. However, uh, that uh, compared to other big databases uh, worldwide available is quite small. In that sense, electronic health records and the research data, both from clinical trials or the academic research, that uh, all together in the European health data space, that would be something. And I think that if we don't have it, then we will just lose an opportunity. My next slide is uh, exactly describing this order of, uh, uh, as I see it, it's the, the opportunities, first of all, what is that we see as the valuable, uh, uh, valuable uh, in output from uh, what we are looking for uh, from health data. Uh, I think that a good example here is the European reference networks, where we can already now share information about the patients with rare or complex diseases. And that very clearly illustrates the need and an opportunity. We have this opportunity and it works. And uh, when you speak to people with rare diseases, you feel this uh, support that they have and uh, the way they can overcome the obstacles with the goodwill sometimes, not necessarily the technical or uh, legal solutions involved, but that is the real need for it. I think we could, uh, from this health data exchange, uh, improve 
uh, the quality of our treatment because we could have the comparison uh, with other hospitals and we could learn from there what it is that they are doing differently in order to achieve these results. We could do much better research research because sometimes we just don't have enough uh, patients for uh, this or another type of study uh, for clinical trials for uh, specific medicines. Now, when we are talking about personal medicine, I think that we should really focus on the bigger scale uh, studies while we can uh, combine the patients from different countries as well as the academic work uh, and other clinical studies where sometimes the hypothesis needs to be tested in other uh, clinical settings and in more than one country. And that would all contribute to better evidence-based guidelines, which are the necessity in uh, every uh, specialty that we have uh, in medicine. So that these are the opportunities that are easily achievable if we would meet or overcome the challenges that we are facing. We have to agree the objectives of what is the purpose of sharing this information. If we take into account the opportunities that I listed before, having the research, the secondary use of data altogether, that is already the objective good enough to work towards it. If we agree on the quality of data, that we agree on what is that we collect and in which format and who does the, the check, for the, or the verification of the quality of data. I think that is also something that we are working on. We should work on this together, and that would bring us the results where we do not necessarily have to talk about the quantity of data that would bring us the correct results. We can, with the quality of data, we can uh, really count on uh, less data uh, necessary. Interoperability issues, I think that we have been talking about that for uh, many years. Some improvements have been made. We have the European standards which are recommended for the use. However, with the semantics, we haven't moved forward. And that is sometimes when I am very proud about the Europe, but at the same time, that brings the uh, problems with this uh, language that we use describing the patient case. And how do we, uh, what kind of... Uh, uh, data we use for the laboratory, radiology, pathology, and how it all to bring together, that may be a, a problem, but I am absolutely sure we can overcome it. We can scale things, we can put uh, uh, use the tables uh, with numbers when we have agreed what is behind that, and that is possible even if we speak the different uh, languages. And of course, organizational, because when I spoke about the quality of uh, healthcare services, then of course you have to have an organizational agreement that that comparison is beneficial for everybody, the patients, the healthcare providers, the policymakers, those who do planning, those who spend money. And uh, that is something that we have to have the cultural agreement. And of course, you cannot not speak about the data protection and cybersecurity, uh, but that is something that is legally binding. Uh, how, however, on data protection, we have some differences between the member states and that's what the general data protection uh, regulation allows us. Uh, but I hope that uh, with the agreed objectives and read the quality criteria, and when we have met all the interoperability requirements, we can uh, also overcome this challenge quite easily. That would be briefly from me, and uh, really looking forward if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this really insightful and well-structured perspective of the healthcare provider. Um, I would now ask Martin Gaivats from the perspective of the government, um, from the Government Office of Estonia, to, uh, to tell um, his views, share, share your views. Martin, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, thank you very much, Teria, for this very pragmatic and practical intro. Uh, I will try to give a bit, bit of a helicopter view to this whole subject, because uh, as the national digital advisor for the government of Estonia and responsible for everything digital and innovation related in, in this small country of 1.3 million people, uh, I'm also working together with the World Health Organization as a member of the Dig Digital Health Technical Advisory Group. Uh, and since 2019, October, 
I, I was kind of given the mandate to investigate health data interoperability on a global level. And uh, well, this is a bit more on, a, on the higher level side. So, um, and some of those nuances that uh, Terje that was talking about are critical. But, but again, I'm a bit looking at the whole picture from, from yeah, a kind of a bird's eye or a helicopter view. So in the global scene today, there is lack of any basic trust. Uh, uh, like the pandemic, uh, which I would argue is one of the best exercises of individual responsibility uh, in our lifetimes and probably in our parents' lifetimes as well. Uh, there's a lack of trust and lack of trust in very, very, very basic things. So um, when in 2019, the WHO CIO uh, and the Digital Health Technical Advisory Group, we started investigating uh, the cases for health data interoperability, again, on a high level. And, uh, and, and uh, the point was that when we are building trust, we need to do it in a way that can be utilized in many different use cases. So, so there were several workshops that were undertaken uh, in Geneva pre-pandemic. And, and again, uh, something like three weeks before WHO announced the pandemic, uh, the WHO also represent, uh, presented the case for the yellow vaccination card, uh, the, the point which we now call vaccination certificates, and how to augment it or enhance it digitally. But... In this whole picture, we need to acknowledge a couple of things. Uh, and and, and more, more or less, uh, since then, uh, the government of Estonia has been really, really in the epicenter of, of these discussions. Been working together both with the, with the WHO and the EU in, in trying to figure this thing out. But there are a few notes or ideas that, that are, are critical here. As mentioned, the pandemic is an exercise on global, uh, uh, in the globally in individual responsibility. Uh, there are many people that are actually staying home now and, and not going outside, and they are they are practicing this responsibility. And and similar type of responsibility and trust needs to be established between uh, the member states because uh, and, and we're not talking about those. Uh, advanced use cases uh, that uh, more or less uh, 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 Terje was mentioning currently, but we're talking about some very baseline things. And one of the, those things is that, ironically, uh, there is no organization on this planet that knows the names of all of the different hospitals in the world. Like, for example, Deria is from the North Estonian Medical Center, which in Estonia is, uh, the acronym is called PER. Then most people, <laughs> we here know it because it is the biggest hospital, but most people like, I don't know, the, the Cambodian border guard not necessarily <laughs> knows what PER is. Or, <laughs> or, or how many hospitals do you guys know in UK or in Vietnam? Maybe some, but not necessarily all of the thousand different healthcare providers in Estonia, for example. And while we are working, and the WHO is also working actively on, on figuring out uh, the global trust framework that is necessary for, for the deployment of the smart vaccination certificates, the current scene is that each of those governments and countries, they are deploying various different technologies, and, and and these need to meet certain standards and minimum viable data set. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Peyton and, and later on Constantin will, will explain the work done in, in agreeing those standards and, and minimum viable data sets. But still, I think uh, it's a case that the trust framework is an integral part of this. And, and, and as mentioned by Deria also is that and Terry and Kalle as well, but uh, we should aim higher. Uh, we, should, we should try to do more because currently what I see and being intim intimately part of those discussions in the epicenter, then in certain points, the 
uh, technical and the engineering know-how has surpassed the domain uh, and, 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 and know-how, which basically means that if we, if we are about to build first global trust framework for health data that, that aims to, uh, tries, would like to aim to those things that Deria was mentioning, then perhaps we should think further. And, and for those experts also, is like the point is that uh, the architecture needs to be fast enough I acknowledge that what Carla Gillar was saying, that, that it, this is a long process and, and those health data experts and standards experts, you probably all know it, that these are long discussions about taxonomy and classificators and whatnot. But we should build the system in a scalable way. And by scalable way, I mean in a way that because... I don't necessarily mean that it should scale to the world. Of course it does, because this is like a basic hygiene issue. But it should scale to other use cases as well, so that these other potentials of evidence-based guidelines or, or, or uh, personalized medicine uh, across the borders or digital uh, 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 prescriptions on a global level or any other health data use case that needs to cross the border could be facilitated by the WHO. And the works currently are ongoing. The, there, there are issues there. And, uh, and, uh, and there is also talk. Uh, last Friday, the WHO Smart Vaccination Working Group uh, 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 published their uh, their uh, interim report on the guidelines and, and the idea on how to get this done. Their current suggestion of running a global PKD architecture, sorry for the technical term, does not necessarily meet those demands. So work is ongoing. Estonian government is contributing it to it at the very core of it. We are trying to help our colleagues and friends from from, from the World Health Organization to understand and then aim a bit higher, not only do this very narrow uh, thing uh, of solving the problem of vaccination certificates. So um, I'm pretty sure that the next weeks will we'll bring more news and developments, but again, uh, happy to be part of this global discussion and contributing with the community and the expertise and the know-how from all of the Estonian community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for uh, walking us through uh, the uh, the Estonian government uh, um, activities and and contribution into this uh, this this uh, uh, big um, great thing. Clayton Hamilton from the World Health Organization. Uh, Martin referred to a report that came out uh, just last week. Um, can you tell us more about that and more generally the uh, World Health Organization's uh, views uh, and perspectives on the issue? Yes, thank you very much. And firstly, thank you very much to the organisers uh, for this session, which I think is really timely and really important to actually draw out some of the issues. So what I'd like to do, drawing upon uh, the... the um, the perspectives that Teria and Martin have presented is to really just very briefly touch upon some of the more generic challenges and opportunities as cross-border data exchange and then go a little bit more into the smart vaccination certificate work that WHO and its partners have, have, um, have kicked off. So firstly, really just to reflect for a minute or two on, on the impact that COVID-19 has, ha has had. Um, and I think we all agree that it's really exposed, uh, in particular, a number of uh, inequities and inabilities of health systems to actually respond effectively. When we look at this from the WHO's perspective, um, we've seen quite consistently that countries have struggled to have the ability to have basic access to um, real-time or near-real-time data, including not only accessing it, but an inability to understand how it can be used and leveraged effectively. Now, this is despite the fact that WHO for some time has been emphasising the importance of national health information systems. Um, and really, it's probably the lack of our ability to utilise the data which even exists is one of the most significant shortcomings of the pandemic. 
Now, given also that as we've seen, uh, an infectious diseases don't respect national borders, it really is rather ironic that in 2019, when the pandemic came into being, surrounded by many of the technologies and the data that we have, that we really haven't been able to leverage it in a way, either nationally or cross-border, um, that could have prevented the increase in morbidity and mortality that's ensued, and the protracted lockdowns, which uh, we, we all continue to experience. So in that respect, as Calla had mentioned in the beginning, um, sometimes at the national level, the, the use cases for the exchange of data can be somewhat unclear. Well, certainly now the international use case for the exchange of data is, is crystal clear. And countries and health authorities recognise that now better than ever. So in a, in a way, there is actually um, a silver lining to the pandemic as we've all experienced. We also have to take into account beyond the lessons learned from COVID-19 to look, as Martin was saying, really further beyond and how we can leverage the benefits of digitalization and data to improve the resilience of health systems and the availability of health services and data. And sometimes it's really the case that within uh, particularly European union, union countries that we maybe even take for granted some of the digital services and data that are available to us. And we, we should recognise also that that's not the case in all the countries. In the 53 countries in our European region, which take into account the Balkan countries and the right across to the Central Asian republics, it's a completely different environment. So we have to respect that not everyone is on the same level of digital development. And that, again, makes it a little bit more nuanced in how we actually look to cross-border data exchange. So if we, if we look to the benefits of what there are now, there's some really obvious benefits of cross-border data exchange in terms of provision of services, in terms of continuity of care, and in terms of public health action. But I think the real value will come uh, in terms of being able to gain insight by combining large data sets across natural borders and to apply it to develop new insight um, to move away from health systems which are largely reactionary. So we don't get to uh, individuals un until they present themselves as, as, as having a disease or uh, infirmity. Um, so we want to change that paradigm to a more preventative health paradigm. And we believe that data really has a key role in doing that. It's also a really important part for health system sustainability. So we know the cost of health is generally increasing, health systems are struggling to keep up, and we need to utilise the data and digital tools at our access in order to actually ensure the sustainability and the uh, equity and access to health services for populations. Now, interoperability is not new, as Terry had mentioned, and the European Commission has actually um, had its uh, interoperability framework around since 2015. And what this actually does is recognise interoperability as a combination of legal, organisational, semantic and technical constructs. So, in essence, we know what cross-border interoperability involves, but it's still a very difficult lift, as Martin was saying, to really try and uh, push this further along. So, a lot needs to be done in national parliaments to have agreement um, at the technical level, at the organisational level, and for all of those things to come together to really do it. So I just wanted to touch upon equity also. So not everyone has access to digital solutions to the same extent. And COVID-19 has exposed a large number of socioeconomic um, uh, inequities, but also digital inequities. So we really, from WHO's perspective, have to strive to make sure that we don't simply transplant those socioeconomic um, issues into digital environments. Now to cross to the smart vaccination certificate. So we all know that this is gaining rapid interest by many countries to facilitate gradual and, and, and safe relaxation of public health and social measures. And governments and businesses we know are likely to require proof of vaccination from individuals as a condition for entry or participation, whether it be in domestic um, use cases or for international travel. It's important to point out that smart vaccination certificates are not an immunity passport. They don't have any... Um, record or inference of immunity of an individual, but they are simply a record of vaccination of a WHO approved vaccine having taken place. And we in WHO only consider this within a health context, not to be used for other purposes such as foreign affairs or trade. We also need to take into account that currently, as it is here today, WHO does not uh, recommend uh, proof of COVID-19 vaccination as a condition for departure or entry for international travel. So when we talk about some of the impediments, we still know that there are legal instruments at the international level that we have to work to try and change in order to accept 
the digital solutions that we can we're developing. So the digital environment is is really moving a lot quicker than the and the organizational or legal environments are. But again, that's something that we need to take into account. So at this point, countries are advised to take a risk-based approach to international travel in the context of COVID-19. So what benefits could smart vaccination certificates give us? Well, firstly, unlike their paper equivalents, they're significantly more complicated to forge. And we've already seen cases of forged COVID-19 uh, vaccination certificates uh, in, in a paper form circulating. Um, they can support public health monitoring over and above a, a simple paper uh, form. So, for example, they can help us report on adverse events following immunisation. They, as Martin pointed out, can facilitate data sharing across systems and across national borders. And if need be, uh, they can actually be revoked. So you can actually withdraw a certificate if there is an issue with a vaccine or if the simply the vaccine validity as it's determined at the international level requires. So what's WHO doing about this? Well, right now, the Digital Health and Innovation Department in Geneva um, is leading a development of a standards-based certificate. So the standards itself, rather than a commercial product or any specific product for cross-border use as a digital public health good. So technical colleagues from the European Commission, from all corners of the globe, are heavily engaged in helping us define those standards. And this will essentially be a consistent data representation, how certificates could potentially be exchanged across borders, how they're governed, privacy and security surrounding them. And as Martin also mentioned, a common trust framework across all types of users. WHO is taking a paper first approach in terms of ensuring equity. So again, coming back to the fact that we know not everyone has a smartphone, not everyone can actually access digital solutions in the same way. We believe that going with a paper first approach is really the best approach that we can. And there are two scenarios that we're adopting for this. And that is the first one is a proof of vaccination. So that a certificate can be presented as proof that the bearer has received a vaccine for COVID-19 and that this claim can be checked and validated by an interested party. The second is continuity of care scenario or use case that a certificate can be presented to a medical authority nationally so that the bearer's vaccine status can be considered as part of continuing to provide care to an individual. So in this sense, it also forms part of a personal health record. So I'll, I won't go too much more into detail, but just to say that in order for this to work, then we really need to look to the technology of establishing a global digital trust framework that will allow these certificates issued by national authorities to be trusted across national borders. Now, again, um, we've all seen that we have financial transactions that, that go every second of every day across national borders. So why is this so difficult in a health context? Well, we'll really, um, health has been for quite some time uh, lagging, I think, in this area, but really the pandemic has really caused a new impetus to try and help us bring this together. So the solutions uh, will hang upon the establishment of this trust framework, which without getting too technical again, could rely on a number of technical solutions, whether it be a public uh, key infrastructure or another services-based infrastructure. WHO sees itself as having a mandate for holding the, the root or the, the, the guardianship of, of such a global trust framework. It won't hold any protected or personal information in this, but it will allow for that trust exchange uh, issuing and verification to take place. So last Friday, WHO released its first guidelines. It wasn't actually reported. It was a set of guidelines on developing smart vaccination certificate that has come from the global working groups and there are three major working groups that have been working for months to develop, release candidate one of these guidelines. They're available for everyone on the who.int uh, website. And there's a period up until April now where it's, we're opening for public consultation to help improve them. So they really are still in a very preliminary phase, but again, it's seen as being the first step up until around about the end of June, where we hope to finalize this and then be able to give them to countries in order to establish a standard for the data format how the certificates are actually um, constructed and the uh, and and their exchange. On top of this, then we will pilot a global digital trust framework that will allow us to set up and ensure that these um, certificates are actually capable to be exchanged. Now there are a lot more issues around it, and even from WHO's perspective, it's still very new to us. So uh, we're drawing upon the expertise globally to make sure that we actually. Uh, are able to bring this together and do it in such a way that we ensure 
that everyone, irrespective of their, their national income level and their personal income level, are able to use these tools for both domestic and international use cases. I'll leave it there for the moment and happy to answer any questions that come up at a later time. Thank you so much. Clayton Hamilton, thank you so much for walking us through uh, and, and giving us a very rich um, um, overview of, of the World Health Organization's position on this. I think we've uh, tried to pack, uh, pack it as nicely as possible into this uh, short amount of panel time, starting from the perspective, starting from a specific going to the more general, starting from the perspective of a care giver or care provider, moving on to the government and then the international level. Um, in trying to provoke you all into a bit of a discussion and, and, and asking some questions, Teria, I wanted to turn to you first. And again, excuse me for being a bit provocative. Uh, I, I really enjoyed your very clear set out of the uh, opportunities and challenges. But let's face it, what we've seen through media over the past year in Estonia, in Europe and across the world about the situation in hospitals is pretty scary. Overload of patients, doctors under stress, um, and, and, and really, really worrisome scenes and pictures. This is not sustainable situation because clearly the COVID-19 virus will not be going away. It will stay with us, uh, probably mutating. So my question to you in this COVID situation, do you think the solutions to find out or to improve the situation um, that we are seeing in hospitals um, does, the, uh, does it lie in a uh, possibility of various international stakeholders investing more into digital solutions? Or do you think the solutions are somewhere uh, beyond digital? And what is the role of the hospitals themselves in all of this? What role um, can the hospitals take? If you could quickly tell, uh, tell what you think on this. Yeah, well... <laughs> I have to say that the situation cannot continue like this. That's that's not possible. We are currently, for example, in our ho hospital, reducing the planned uh, treatment and all kind of planned procedures that uh, people have to uh, really wait uh, longer. Either it is the surgical procedure or, or it is in any other type of uh, investigation or uh, the planned treatment. Uh, and uh, that is not uh, sustainable for sure. Uh, we cannot digitize uh, COVID either. So uh, that doesn't help here much. I strongly believe that if people would follow the rules and we, people would get vaccinated, uh, uh, that would uh, help the situation. If it would be mutated, I'm sure that the vaccines will be adjusted accordingly. And uh, this type of uh, citizen responsibility uh, is important. What digital can do in that context uh, and what it has already done, and I am very grateful for this, because the science and the understanding of medicine, that is not isolated anywhere in the world now. Uh, maybe North Korea, but uh, in principle, uh, the scientific knowledge that we have and that we gave through the experience is uh, the information that provides us some tools in order to address the disease more effectively. I think we're doing already now better than we did a year ago because we know more. And uh, last spring, uh, what helped uh, for example, Estonian hospitals to prepare for the pandemic was the knowledge that we received from colleagues who had already faced, uh, faced it. I think our doctors had a regular uh, uh, connection with the doctors from Italy, for example, to learn about the ways of treating in the ICU or the ways of treating uh, people with rare diseases or how to handle the uh, patient with COVID and uh, cardiac uh, issues or the COVID and uh, uh, oncology, I think that is all this type of information that we can get out from the database and the source of information, and that is the digital source of information. It has, of course, to have its quality and the proof of concept, etc., but it is accessible. I think 
uh, as regards the patient and uh, increase the responsibility in that context. That is also the quality of information. I think that here we are facing with a lot with the same problem that Europe has had or the world has had uh, as regards the vaccination and anti-vaccination uh, movements and how we can uh, increase the knowledge with the science and how we can improve the, the health literacy of people, which would bring this type of patient empowerment and the patient engagement and the citizen engagement. And again, what I'm repeating, this type of responsible behavior. That is what digital can do, because if we people would be digitally literate, digitally health literate, then they can choose the source of information and they can verify the quality of this information. Who is talking about what and what is that this information you have to do with? Because literacy is not only reading and understanding, it is also about applying this knowledge. And that's why I think that the digital, in that sense, has a, uh, also a good value. Uh, I am um, not sure, I cannot really uh, come up with any kind of um, uh, percentage of how much it would contribute to have this vaccination passport. I think that it has another purpose of it. Uh, but in principle, in order to gain the sust sustainability in our hospitals, Digital can do a lot, but I would say that this is far beyond the, the COVID. It is on uh, each and every aspect, because I think that if uh, uh, we could uh, facilitate the speed of the uh, access to uh, a service or uh, provide the teleservices, or we could provide the telemonitoring, or we would use the patient reported outcome measures, which would help much faster to uh, uh, react on the changes or the trends. That would uh, reduce unnecessary hospitalizations, that would increase the quality of life of people with uh, chronic conditions, and all these elements in involve digital. And overall, as I said, just understanding of the disease that is coming through the data. And if these data are digital, they are good quality and accessible and anal analyzable. That is what we are looking for. And that is, that is what is absolutely must for uh, making the healthcare system sustainable. Absolutely. Daria, thank you very much for making it so clear and, and uh, putting it in so clear terms. You really are a star and it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Um, I know that we are pressed with time and that there is not uh, really as much, uh, as much time left for the discussion and questions as I'd like, uh, as I'd like it. But I still want uh, to squeeze in at least one question to you, Martin, uh, in trying to provoke you a little bit. Um, I mean, you are coming from the government uh, level. Um, Every crisis management uh, needs political uh, leadership. Yet all the political decisions will be applied and implemented at the level of the public service or administration by the officials. So what, on your opinion, is the role of politicians in this? Um, are they helpful? And how... Uh, uh, can um, and should they use better the um, public administration in finding solutions? So this relationship between the politicians and the, um, the public service and, and how useful are politicians in all of this, in finding solutions? I, I'll try to keep it short. I think, uh, yeah, the role of politicians is fairly clear here. Take Jacqueline from New Zealand. She has been super crystal clear in communicating what needs to be done and, uh, and, and, and I would say still that, that the clear communication is the main objective of politicians in such a scenario. And, and the rest is basically the role of experts because this is uh, not the black and white scenario. There are likelihoods and maybes and there's always a bit of lottery and gamble in this game. I think and still believe that we need to have leadership like like New Zealand, like like our neighbours in Finland, in, in as Sanna, and uh, and uh, and and to have a very clear message to to be constantly in a mixed message scenario. Then that's the worst that can happen and has happened in many places. Thank you, thank you. That's thank very you. clear. Thanks for that. 
Um, all that we have time left now, I think, is to uh, one last sort of like really flash round of all three of you, um, underlining perhaps uh, one last important issue that you would like to stress. And Clayton, uh, I would start from you, um, if you if you don't mind. Sure. So one one important factor, I think, the issue of trust uh, came up mentioned by Martin, and you don't go very far in such dialogues such as this um, without trust coming to the issue. I wanted to point out that the European Union's um, Agency for Human Rights, in, in a survey last year, pointed out that between one in four and one in five EU citizens don't trust uh, sharing any of their personal data with governments at all. That um, goes well beyond health data. So we need to work harder in order to, to establish trust and trust in the use of data. And I think going back to the question of politicians, good policy, accountability and transparency is probably the key way forward. We need better data governance in order to be able to utilise more effectively the data we have for improving our health situations. And without it, I think we're going to have a circular discussion about trust for years to come. We need to act a lot faster in having that and understand what it really means to have data governance and understand what that impact is in developing tr public trust. Because the situation is now, citizens don't want to share their uh, personal information with governments, but are freely doing so with the, the private sector for many, uh, many solutions. So again, that would be my number one issue to try and tackle quickly. Thank you. Thank you. That's really wise. Deria, what would you have, uh, what would you say for like one last thing? Uh, so as a key takeaway. That's actually not my uh, my uh, wisdom. It actually comes from the European Patient Forum, who has the project called Data Saves Lives. That's what I want to say. Data saves lives. Yeah. And if we need to, if I would have a plea, then I would ask for really European Union, make this health data space happen and give funding for it. Excellent. Thanks very much. Martin, last sort of like takeaway for us to, to leave, leave us with. So the quick takeaway, I'm pretty new to this health data space. And uh, basically two things. Uh, I would like the World Health Organization to actually step up their game and actually start playing a role in digital health and data and the cross-border exchange of data not only in the vaccination certificates use case. And also, um, just for the nerds listening out, because I know that the eGovernance Academy has the technological experts as well, uh, the proposed PKD solutions uh, that are being discussed is just not the adequate fit, and there is many arguments there. But let's continue those discussions in other rooms. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. It's been a real true pleasure of discussing these pertinent things with you. And, uh, and, uh, but the discussion does continue.